Okay, recording has started. If in right. All right. Okay, anyway. Um Let's get started. Okay, I think it's fine. Uh, I don't know how it changed between. Okay, good, good. So let's go to section three. Let me just go ahead and share this. Oh, section four, sorry. Section four. Sanctified, made holy in Christ. Right? Section 4, page 48. Sanctified, made holy in Christ. So, we're changing uh, topic a little bit. This is another aspect of who we are in Christ. That in Christ, we are sanctified. Right? The word sanctified or sanctification means to be made holy. It means to be set apart for God. Right? Set apart for God. Holy. To be made holy. So when, when we read the word sanctify, sanctification, sanctified, it simply means to be made holy. So we say holiness. It, it's the same root word. You know, that same word. Sometimes it's translated holy sometimes translated sanctify it means the same thing okay so example suppose you know we buy a guitar you buy a guitar you go to the shop in the shop uh, they're selling many guitars you go buy a guitar now somebody who knows how to play this guitar they could they could take this guitar and you know use it for singing all kinds of songs but if they make a choice, they buy this guitar and they say, I will use this guitar only to sing worship to God. Only. I'll use only for that. Then what have they done? They have sanctified the guitar. I mean, they kept this guitar aside only for holy use. You understand it? It is sanctified. Set apart. It's only for holy use. So when we say holiness, holiness simply means you are set apart, set aside for God. That's what it means to be holy. And what we will learn in Scripture is that when you and I, when we came into Christ, when we were born again, and we received Jesus, we came into Christ. In Christ, we are sanctified. In Christ, God has already sanctified you. In Christ, you are already made holy. The work is done. So, you're not trying to become holy. You have been made holy. God has already sanctified you. God has set you apart. You already fully belong to God in Christ. So God finishes the work. He says, I already kept you aside for myself. You're sanctified for me. You're holy to me. But now, in everyday life, I want you to live 
as a sanctified person because he has already sanctified you i want you to live like that so that is living in holiness to live in holiness is not trying to become holy but to live in holiness is because god has made me holy i'm going to live like that you understand there is a big difference because one if you're trying to become holy by living holy then you're trying to go to some place you're trying to achieve that with your own strength but when you live out of a place of holiness that god has already made you and given to you then you're coming from a place of strength god has done this for me therefore i'm going to live like this i will say to i will say no to sin i will say no to unrighteousness i will say no to wicked things i will say no to temptation because god has already made me holy he said i made you mine i made you holy to me you are a holy person to me i've set to your part for me so now live like that so your your behavior your attitude your choices flow from that place of knowing that you have been set apart for god oh god has made me holy i live like that right so that's what we are going to see so there is two things positionally god has made you holy that is sanctification but sanctification is also a process that means you're living out that holiness in everyday life so it's a work that is completed but it's a work that is happening god has completed the work in jesus but it's happening in your life and mine on a day to day basis so we must understand that let's look at it lesson 34 So again, yeah, we look at the Greek words there. Now let's look at this. First Corinthians chapter one, verse thirty. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. So Christ is our sanctification. that means when we came into christ god sanctified us and he sanctified us meaning christ is our sanctification meaning you are set apart for god the same way jesus is set apart for god think about that same way because christ is your sanctification so our standard is not somebody else our standard is jesus see many times we think like this oh look at that brother or or that sister like oh he does this i don't do it so i'm better than him he is not your sanctification jesus is your sanct christ is our sanctification that means i am speak up to jesus will jesus do not If Jesus will not do it, I won't do it. If Jesus will do it, okay, I'll do it because He is my sanctification. I am to be set apart for God the same way that Jesus is set apart for God. You understand? So we're not comparing ourselves with each other. We have to compare ourselves with Jesus. Christ is our sanctification. That is the standard. Ephesians chapter one, verse four. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. So we are holy. That word sanctified. We are holy. He has made. He has made us holy. Right. Righteousness means on top of page forty-eight. Uh, righteousness there seems to be a loose connection here uh righteousness means there is no condemnation 
Holiness means there is no sin, no evil. We're living that set apart life. So God is righteous, God is holy. He's given to us His righteousness and He has set us apart for Himself. We live holy. Right? So Christ, in Christ, we are sanctified. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Lesson number 35, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. So, I would all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. So, who are we as believers? We are sanctified in Christ Jesus. And we are called to be saints. The word saint simply means a sanctified one. A holy one. So when you say saint, you're a holy one. You're a sanctified one. And so in Christ, you are sanctified. So let this get into your thinking. You are sanctified in Christ. Jesus. So in Christ, you have been sanctified. You have been set apart for God. You are a saint. You are a holy one. That's who you are. So in Christ means you are a saint. So you see, you can call the other person saint, <laughs> Saint John, Saint, <laughs> Saint, you are a saint. That means you are a holy one. You are set apart for God. You are sanctified in Christ. You are a saint. Right? Again, Paul writes this to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. The passage we already memorized. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Paul writes, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified. You were sanctified. Or you can put it like this. You have been sanctified. God has already set you apart, made you holy for himself. Who? The same people who in the past, they were drunkards, they were all these kinds of things, they were doing all these things. God says, that was, that was the way you were, but now in Christ you have been sanctified. God has already set you apart for himself. Brought you out from all those things. But the same people, practically day to day, they are still having problems. How do we know? You, know? you read the rest of Corinthians. All kinds of problems they are having. They are fighting among themselves. Uh, when they come for Holy Communion, they are rushing, saying, who will get the big piece of bread? Who will get a big cup of <laughs> wine or juice? They are fighting. All those things are going on. So practically, you see, uh, how can these people be holy? They are having all these problems going on. But Paul is writing to them and says, God, you were... God has sanctified you. So therefore, he can tell them how to behave in a holy way, how to behave properly. But as far as they are concerned, he says, you have been sanctified in Christ. You are called to be saints. You were sanctified. It's done. See, God has done this for you. Now you behave like that. So he's teaching them how to behave. Yes. It's like God has sanctified us. Yes. They remove the sin. He removed the sin yes. from our body, our mind, everything. Yeah. But now if we sin, like He have made us holy. But now if He have made us holy. Yes. But now when we are sinning, after being sanctified, it's because it's it's like now if we are sinning, it's we are put forcefully we are putting sin into our body it's like that we are letting sin gain access so like we said earlier 
our minds, our soul and our body needs to be practically set apart for God. So as long as we continue to expose our soul and our body, our de desires to all these worldly things, we will tend to sin. How does that affect us? Like one, we said it affects our relationship with God. It also affects how we experience God. Because sin will enslave us. Sin opens the door to the devil to trouble us. So the believer begins to experience all these things. But it's not because of God's fault. So if I'm going to tell some brother, some sister, that you are sanctified by God, now you are holy from God. So, so if you sin now, if you commit sin, it is from you, not from now. It is, it is who you are putting that sin into your life because God has made you holy too. So now try to be holy. So if I'll say like that, it is correct or not? Yeah, that's what we should tell them. Tell them right? that we need to awaken believers to know that in Christ they are sanctified, that they are actually holy people to God. They are saints. That's, that's what Paul is writing to these Corinthians. You know, see, like how he begins his letter. You know, he says to the church of God which is at Corinth, to all of you who are terrible sinners, who are you no. Know, he doesn't start like that. Right? He's telling them, you know, First Corinthians one two, to the church which is at Corinth, to those of you who are sanctified in Jesus, you are called to be saints. And later on, he gives, gives them nice. <laughs> so he begins by saying, look, you are saints, but you're not behaving like that. Yeah, so in the rest of the letter, he gives them nice. <laughs> he corrects them so much, a lot of correction, different things. right? But he says, you are saints. You're called to be saints. And you have been made a saint. But your behavior doesn't show it. I need to bring correction. So throughout the letter, he'll correct them, corrects them. That's what we need to help each other in that. Okay. So, but but we need to know in order to live in holiness, in order to live like a saint. We need to start with this, knowing that we have been made holy, knowing that we are saints. We start with that. And so because God has sanctified me in Jesus, now I'm going to live that life as a sanctified person. And the empowering is there from the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. We will... We will Get into that. So, um, if you look on page 50, um, I, 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 I made these statements there on page 50, if you can follow with me. Uh, and it's good to say these things for yourself. You know, it's a, I, I made it here. I am holy in Christ, therefore, I keep all sin away from my spirit, soul, and body. So I am holy. So I keep sin away. Hey, don't come, don't, don't, don't come, don't dirty my clothes. Give. So imagine, suppose you wear some nice, you know, some nice suit, new clothes you're wearing. And you're going out, then one puppy dog comes. And wants to jump on you. What do you do? Say, <laughs> wait, don't jump. These clothes are very clean. I don't want your paw prints here on my clothes. <laughs> like that. I am holy. So stay away. You know, I don't want this on, on me. Right? That's the mindset we must have. God has sanctified me. Therefore, this sin, now you may feel interested in playing with the puppy dog, but now my clothes are all clean. I can't. I don't want to dirty it. 
Okay. Another statement. I am holy in Christ. Therefore, I crucify the sinful desires of my body by the power of the Holy Spirit. And there's Romans 8.13 there. Next one. I am holy in Christ. Therefore, I purify and renew my mind by hearing and obeying the truth of His Word. I am holy. Therefore, I pursue a lifestyle of holiness before, because the new creation in me is created in righteousness and true holiness. Right? So it comes from that place of knowing you are holy. You have been made a saint. You have been made, uh, you have been set apart for God. Therefore, you keep your mind, you keep your body, you keep everything clean before God. So it's good to, you know, you make a note of those statements, keep speaking that over yourself. And even when you're facing temptation, you make these statements according to the Word of God. So, extending this thought, we build on this lesson number 36. We are saints in Christ. Saint means a holy person, a holy one. So you are a sanctified one. You are a holy one. You know, Paul writes to the Corinthians, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. So every believer is a saint. You know, sometimes, oh, you have a question? Yes. Sir, can you please explain Romans chapter verse 3, 22? Romans? Chapter 3, verse 23. Yeah. So Romans 3, 23. Uh, Paul is writing, he says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, which is true, right? Romans 3, verse 10. There is no one who is righteous, not even one. Which is our condition before we became believers. Right? Ephesians 2, verse 1 and 2. Paul is saying, Before we became believers, we were dead in our sins. We walked according to the course of this world. So there is a difference between a sinner and a saint. Before you were born again, you and I were sinners. Now you are a saint. You understand the difference? So, so it is only upright for who is no born, sir? Sorry? It is only applied for who is uh, newborn in the Christ. I sorry, I don't know. Which one? The Roman chapter. Romans 3.23 is applicable to those who are not yet born again. Yeah, it's only for them. Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, right? It is for those who have not yet been born again. But now we are in Christ. So before you were a sinner, now you are a saint. Before we were darkness, now you are light. Look at one scripture here, Ephesians chapter 5. This will help us. Ephesians 5, verse 8. Ephesians 5, verse 8. Everybody turn there. Okay. Ephesians 5. Can you read it, please? Ephesians 5, verse 8. Ephesians 5, verse 8, please. For you were... For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Ah. Notice the difference. You were in darkness. darkness. Now who are you? Light. light. Now you are? Light. light. So now if I call you darkness, it is not correct. Now you are? So you were a sinner. Now you are a saint. Now if I call you a sinner, not correct. Okay. 
because you were a sinner now you are a saint you were darkness now you are light change our identity has changed so romans 3 is talking about the past for all have sinned you're a sinner but you were a sinner now you are righteous you were a sinner now you are a saint so we are talking about our life in Christ. Okay. Daniel. Uh, is there any difference between uh, born again spirit and human spirit? Are they one or uh, they are different? Born again spirit and human spirit. Okay. So the human spirit. So when we say human spirit, we're talking about the human, our human spirit for every man. So every human being is spirit. That is what we refer to as human spirit. Now the human spirit can be dead or alive. I mean, dead means there is no life. The life of God is not there. So when the human spirit receives Jesus, then that human spirit is born again. So that's what we refer to as the born again human spirit, the born again spirit. But the same human spirit, if they're not born again, we say they are dead. Dead doesn't mean it doesn't exist or it's not active. It just means there is no life of God. So look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 17. Ephesians 4, or let's read verse 18. Ephesians 4, verse 18. Could you read it, please? Have, okay. Having the understanding that being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Thank you. So notice here, it's talking about the sinner. It's talking about our life before we came to know Christ. What does it say? We are alienated from the life of God. That means we don't have the life of God. So that is the human spirit when it's not born again. They don't have God's life. But when we are born again, the human spirit receives the life of God. So that's the born again human spirit. You understand, no? Yeah, now uh, we are perfect and holy, righteous, everything. Now, after being born again. After we are born again, that's our identity. That's what has happened to our spirit. So that's why, like we said, Romans 3.23 doesn't apply because we are born again. We have received the life of God. We are no longer sinners. We are saints. Clarify. Clear or full doubt? No doubt. Any other question? Yes. Please ask. Pastor, I don't have a doubt that I am not the righteousness. I don't have a doubt. I am the righteousness of God. I am holy and yes. I am sanctified. I am the saint of Christ. Yes. Uh, I don't have a doubt with it. Yes. So, uh, but when somebody hears this, it sounds superficial. Uh, like you are righteousness of God. Even to a person who is a newborn believer, like when you say, like they will, it feels almost superficial because like you are the righteousness of God. God has given his righteousness on you. Like uh, God has given his holiness to you. He has made you. But for them, it's like, I've done so many mistakes. Mm -hmm. I've sinned. And yeah. uh, uh, so how can I be the righteousness of God? Mm. So so all these questions are there in a person's mind, mind. When, when, when they initially come to Christ. Yes. Uh, because uh, this, uh, is it that when the person is newborn, all these truths are deposited in the spirit? And slowly, those truths are 
taught by the Holy Spirit. They, they are convicted uh, to the person or he, the Holy Spirit convinces the person that you are the righteousness of God, you are the holiness of God. Is that so? Or the person has to take um, steps by his own and learn these truths. Yeah. So it's the second part. I mean, God has done the work so in our spirits, right? But each one of us need to receive a revelation of this. And this is what Paul prays. He prays for the believers in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. You look at it. Ephesians chapter 1. He says... Um, verse, uh, verse 19 onwards. So, so he's praying for new believers. Okay, see what he prays. Therefore, verse 9, verse, sorry, verse 15 onwards. Ephesians 1, verse 15. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayer. So, you know, after they came to faith in Jesus, he's praying for them. This is what I'm praying for you. What is he praying? Verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So I, I says, God, I want God to give you the Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and you're a believer. You have faith in Jesus. I'm very happy you're happy. But you need wisdom and revelation. I'm praying God to give you the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom and revelation. For what? He continues, uh, in the knowledge of Him. I mean, you need to know Him. First thing. Second, the eye, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saint? So, and then he continues, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? So he's praying, God, give them wisdom and revelation. Let the eyes of their understanding be opened. So they will know four things. What is it? First, they should know you. Second, they should know the hope of their calling. That is the future of their calling. What does God call them to? Many believers, you ask them, what is God's calling? I don't know. I'm searching. So what do you need? You need the spirit of wisdom and revelation to open your eyes so you will know the hope of His calling, the future. What has He called you to? Third, that you will know the glory of His inheritance and the saints. That means, what is the inheritance He's given you? As a saint, you're a saint. What is the glorious inheritance he has given you? Many believers don't know. So they are born again. They live. They, they don't know him. They don't know the purpose of their calling. They don't know the glorious inheritance he has given them. And fourth, that you will know the greatness of his power towards us who believe. So four things. You must pray for yourself. Pray for us. Pray for yourself. Pray for other people. God. Give him wisdom, man. So when people come and say, you know, please pray for me. I usually pray this only. God, give them wisdom. Give them understanding. Let them know who you are. Let them know the hope of the calling. Let them know the inheritance that is in that you've given them. Let them know the power that is available. Most believers don't know these four. You understand, right? So we, we need to learn. We need to learn. And that's why we try to teach you. Yes, please. Um, Pastor, uh, so now I, now, I, now we know that it's the latter, that we have to take uh, initial steps to know what yes. God has for us. Yes. Um, also, like, um, Jesus was the sacrifice for us. He was a sacrifice. Yes. He took our sin. He took our condemnation, all curse. Whatever negative is from us, he took it on the cross. He paid the price for us. Yes. Uh, but in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 5.9, it, it says, you shall not worship any other gods. And if you worship, 
you your father like three or four generations i will uh, curse yes uh, so in the old testament the belief was if you do a sin if you commit a sin so god will punish you and your generations to come so isn't it that in the new testament god uh, contradicted his own statement that now uh, if you believe in jesus all sins are gone you are made righteous which is truth and i accept it i i don't have a doubt but uh, when you think of the old testament of this law that if you commit sin you and your generations will be punished but in the new testament god sends his own son to die in our place and whatever is of god is deposited to us so isn't god contradicting there or how can we justify that yeah so galatians chapter 3 verse 13 galatians 3 verse 13 it says christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us for it is written curse it is everyone who hangs on a tree so what did jesus do one of the things you mentioned is a curse the curse of the law that means the law actually had many curses which is one of what you have said like many others if you do if you sin this will happen if sin this will happen all this so actually it would it would have come upon us correctly like you said hey we would suffer all these things but christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law it's like this full the whole law and all the curses all of that came upon jesus christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having come a curse for us and then the next verse verse 14 that the blessing of abraham might come upon us that we might receive the promise of the spirit by faith so all the curse went upon jesus so that now god can say i will give you the blessing of abraham and one of the blessings of abraham is the gift of righteousness so so the thing is that god justified his um whatever he said god justified yes so i will punish you but instead of punishing you i took it upon jesus yes i've punished i've given him all the punishment uh, to him he took it away yes. so you don't need to suffer yes it's just, i am follow god is following what he said yes so he's not violating anything yes any other question cos certification and uh, according to the magic of the fire and the sorry yeah just speak into the mic here yeah, sir what What's is the, the difference between uh, certification and matthew chapter 5 and 8 was it matthew 5 8 what does yeah. it say matthew matthew chapter 5 Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So the sanctification is God setting us apart as holy for Himself. Purity of heart is me making sure my heart is clean and right before God. So we will say purity of heart is me. practicing sanctification in every day life i have to practice it right so sanctification like like we were explaining there are two parts to it one is god completes the work for us that is we are sanctified in christ so god did the work but in every day life he's telling you and me to sanctify ourselves that means live like that 
So Matthew 5, 8, being pure or not, that is me practicing this. Right? So a parallel scripture, for example, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Let's read that. Yeah, go ahead. Second Corinthians 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Yeah. So, if you look at what Paul is saying, and if you actually, if you look at, you know, in 2 Corinthians 6 and 16, he says, we are the temple of God. So he says, you are God's temple. You are holy. So you're already holy. You are God's temple. And because you are holy, because you're God's temple, because you are light, because you belong to Christ, was 2 Corinthians 7, 1, continuing. Keep yourself clean. clean. Cleanse yourself from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit. Perfect holiness in the fear of God. So the temple, you are the temple. It's already holy. It's clean. You are light. You're in Christ. Now keep it clean. That is keeping your heart pure. Example. I'll come to you, Daniel. I know you have a question. Example. I know, you know, I heard, I'm, okay, today we heard less, oh, I've been sanctified, I'm set apart for God. Wonderful. Then my one friend comes and says, hey, God bless me with this one wonderful thing. Something happened. Something like, God bless me like this. Immediately jealousy comes. Jealousy. Feel jealous. God, why you bless him, not me? What must we do? Blessed are the pure in jealousy. No place here. Jealousy comes knocking. It will come. It will come knocking. Sorry. I am pure. My heart is pure. No place here. Bye bye. Right? Blessed are the pure in. So keep, I want to keep my heart pure. Do you feel that jealousy coming? Of course. But will you let it in? No. Or even if it comes, you allow a little bit, you go before God, you blessed him. I was feeling jealous, Lord. Please cleanse me. Cleanse your heart of all, and cleanse yourselves of all filthiness of flesh and spirit. That means some things are not just in the flesh, but in the spirit. You feel in your heart, God, I want to keep my heart clean. Let there be no jealousy in my heart. Remove it away, and I will bless. I will praise you, God, for blessing my brother. I praise you, God, for giving him this wonderful thing. You are a good God, and there is no partiality with you. I know if you bless him, you'll also bless me. I'm ready, Lord. <laughs> so what you do? You're keeping your heart pure. You're keeping your heart clean. You are the temple of God. Now it is your responsibility to keep it clean. You understand? Daniel, question? Yeah. Uh, uh, he has mentioned filthiness of flesh and spirit. Uh, so in spirit we are already pure and holy and righteous uh, how can we uh, cleanse ourselves from our spirit in our spirit yeah so just like what we were saying there are some things that will affect our spirit like unforgiveness example unforgiveness it is in the heart right is it in the born again spirit or it's in our soul? It is. It can affect all all three. See, like some, sometimes we try to separate these things, but unforgiveness will affect our spirit and our soul. Right? That means unforgiveness. There are things in the heart. So your spirit is born again. God has made you a perfect person. He's, he's, he's given you all these things. But he says you got to keep it clean. Unforgiveness will start in the soul. 
That means example. How does it work? Let's think about an example. Somebody, suppose somebody comes and tells me something very rude. Right? What should I do? I should just forgive. I said, you know, they, they may say something. So, Lord, I just forgive and let it go. But if I don't, I go back and I'm, my mind is thinking. Why he said, why he said that? That was so bad. So then it is developing in my soul first. It's developed. Then soon my emotions or my heart also. Next time I see him, I will, or I will try to take revenge or something. So now it's affected my soul and it's gone into my heart. Now there is bitterness in my heart or unforgiveness in my heart. And God is saying, no, don't let that happen. Right? So we have to guard our hearts with all diligence. Right? So there are things that will affect the human spirit. So remember, the human spirit, God has given it the gift of righteousness. God has sanctified it. God has brought us into a relationship with God. But I need to guard my human spirit. From my born-again human spirit, I need to guard it from these wrong things. Unforgiveness, bitterness, jealousy, pride, you know, all these things. Now, of course, it'll start in the soul, but it will affect also the spirit. So he says, guard yourself. You understand? No? So we have to keep our heart pure. Heart and spirit in the New Testament, same thing. Yeah. Any question? Okay. So we are saints in Christ. That's the number 36. Oh, it's already time up. Yes. So in, in, in all of, or not all, but many of Paul's epistles, like we see in Romans 1, 7, Ephesians 1, 1, to the Philippians, to the Colossians, when Paul is addressing these believers, he doesn't call them sinners. He calls them saints. And this is a problem with so many preachers today. When they speak to God's people, they call them sinners. But if Paul was to be preaching today, he will not be calling you a sinner. He'll be calling you a Today, many believers have a sinner mentality, not a saint mentality. Why? Because preachers are calling, you're a sinner, you're a sinner, you're a sinner. But if Paul was preaching, look at his epistles. He's calling the believer, you're a saint, you're a saint, you're a saint, you're a holy person, you're a holy person, you're a holy person. Of course, he corrects sin, but the truth that he is pushing to the believer is, you are a saint, you're not a sinner. So we need to develop that saint mentality, not a sinner mentality. A sinner mentality is, is what, you know, things like, oh, I've always struggled with sin. A saint mentality is, I'm a saint, I don't need to do anything with sin. It will help us live in holiness. All right, let's pause here. Next, next week, one new verse, First John chapter 1, 7, 2, and also the other verses, okay? All right, please take a break. We'll continue this next week. Thank you.